Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this evening, afternoon in Bali. Beautiful place. I'm excited, and as always, I'm always excited, you know, very enthusiastic to be sharing with you the little that I know, right? And again, today is a day that I've brought forward to you some amazing concept, which I believe that the time we're going to spend together, by the end of it, you will definitely live transformed and renewed, right? So, um, while we're on there, before I even get to introduce myself, I always like to tell you the story of the tribe that is in Africa, somewhere in Central Africa. And um, every, at every 18 years old of the boy, before the boy could transcend into manhood, what will happen is uh, this boy will have to leave his family and go into the bush for 77 days. How he survives, how he lives, nobody cares, right? And um, at the end of the 77th day, a male figure out of his family could be his uncle or his brother or somebody that is older that has also been through the same ritual. Uh, that person will meet him at a certain point in the forest, then will have a calabash, right, of color, right, usually in powder, different colors. And with that color, that gentleman will paint steps of color from the meeting point all the way into the newly built house for this gentleman. In that house, there is a lovely woman waiting for him that he's going to marry, right? Now, here's the thing. The reason why I'm telling this story is that what I'm going to do with you, ladies and gentlemen, today is that I'm going to paint for you steps of color so that when you go back to your homes today, you go back fully inspired. You go back with the color of a new mind. You go back with the color of a new life. So that's why we are here today. So can you do that? Yeah, awesome. All right, lovely. So let's dive into it, right? So first of all, People wonder who the heck is Stephen Dosu, right? Who the heck is this gentle, short, black man, right, that is trying to be a speaker? Anyway, who is Stephen Dosu? Stephen Dosu is an author, right? I've written two books thus far. I'm an inspirational speaker, a transformational coach. Why do I transform? I transform people. I transform organizations, right? So I'm the one that you call people's fixer cultural fixer, all right? So I walk into any business, I walk into, into the life of any person, I try to find what is wrong, we fix it, and we bring you back excited and driven again, hungry than ever, to be ready to accomplish your goals, right? I, I've co-founded Leadership.University. Leadership University is basically a concept that redefines education. So instead of the teacher uh, teaching the student, just about grades, because that's what the education is, system is about currently. It's about you studying, you memorize, and then you ruminate, right? But this concept of leadership university, basically, uh, we aim at making educators become classroom psychologists. So instead of just teaching students, you know, a bunch of content, they actually prepare students with the skills that we give them. They prepare the student for real life success. So I'm sure you would agree that in life, I mean, how far you've been thus far is that um, your level of success is almost disproportional to how much you memorize at school. It's more hard to do with your people skills. How were you able to write, uh, uh, re relate to people? How were you able to negotiate? How were you able to show up confidently in front of people and negotiate business deals or whatever the case is, right? If they call you in an interview, what they look at? They look at confidence. But guess what? Nobody teaches how to be confident at school, right? So. At the Leadership University, those are the kind of concepts that we teach teachers. So they actually certify with us through the American Institute of Business Psychology. They certify through this university as classroom psychologists, right? So other things that I'm also involved in, by the way, you can check out some of my uh, uh, podcasts on SoundCloud and Spotify. And some other things I'm, I'm involved in as well is Ignited Transformation basically is my event brand that brings together uh, speakers all around the world. And uh, we speak about different topics. I've had Ignited transformation in the seven most predominant areas of your life. I've had ignited transformation with the seven flares of leadership, of, in which I welcome some of the best world speakers, like Arthur Kamazi, which is the world top fourth thought leader, right? And the last one we did, we've had about 13,000 views. It was in, in uh, partnership with JCI, Junior Chamber International. Amu Afri University, um, like Jim Rohn says, that when death comes and finds you, let it find you climbing another mountain. Right, not sliding an old one. So I'm the kind of person that after I reach one challenge, I'm going after the next. So Amu here that you're looking at is gonna be my project for next year. We're looking at October, right? 
So Afro, I mean, sorry, Afri Money Online University is going to be a platform, a virtual education platform that's going to teach young Africans about mindset, investment, money management, and how to build a business, right? Because those are some of the challenges that we face out there. And I intend on doing something about it. And what I'm going to do about it is to educate. That's what this platform is going to be about. And then we have Salesforce Marketing, and then we have Salesforce Catalyst. Salesforce Catalyst, I started Salesforce Catalyst about three years ago after leaving Africa to Asia. And it's all about motivation, leadership, self-development, right? Finding the best version of yourself. And everything that I've spoken about thus far goes through one one and one business, which is the Salesforce Marketing to advertise, website, SEO, you name it, right? So now that you've taken the white elephant out of the room, you can feel free to Google it, right? Don't believe what he says, just Google it, right? And hear uh, what he says. Actually, my mom, uh, <laughs> I mean, my mom is, is not a technology person, right? Um, I mean, she grew up in the, you know, me, like 50 years ago. She's going to be 60, 67 soon, right? And um, <laughs> I mean, if she sends you WhatsApp voice notes, it's usually like 20 or 30 minutes. You know, so it's like an album, basically, right? <laughs> and um, I was very surprised. Like, a few days ago, she called me like, hey, man, listen, I Googled you. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know how to use Google now? <laughs> you know, so if my mom can use Google, I'm sure you can use it too, right? So just Google it. Okay, now, talking about Google, I want to share a story with you, right? So my brother is actually in the U.S. Army, and um, um, he's in the Special Force, and I've noticed that they've been trained to be very skeptical at everything, okay? So, um, I mean, you, you tell him something and he always finds a way to, you know, find the danger in it for whatever reason. And, uh, I mean, when this whole Google thing became, you know, a huge vibe, he someday found out on the internet there was this boy, you know, this boy in Brazil that was doing um, amazing things. And him being him, he jumped on a plane and then went to Brazil. Now, what was this boy doing? This boy, by the way, was born with no arms, right? So all this boy had were his, his legs. And so he'll basically walk on his knees or crawl. And the father of this boy was a sculptor. So the father of this boy would sculpture things, but, but the father had, had arms and legs. So at the age of seven, this boy started sculpturing things with his feet. And according to my brother, the things that this boy made, right, were some of the most amazing art that he has ever seen with his feet, right? And apparently, and I'm talking about this like seven, eight years ago, and in the area of the boy, we're talking, you know, in the, in the, in the radar of at least 10 to 15 kilometers, even in the churches, the homes. So the work of this boy were being bought, basically consumed by the whole entire population of that area. And when the father of this boy was asked, so, you know, what do you think about, you know, the great thing that your boy is accomplishing with his feet? And this was the answer of the father. The father said, I mean, with tears, that I do not know that my boy had such potential, right? So potential, so what is potential? That got me to wonder what is potential, right? So I dive into this term of potential and I found out that the word potential actually originated from the Greek word, which is potentialist, right? Potentialist in Latin, which is potent, which is then power, right? So what is the definition of potential? And that's what we're going to try to do right now to try to understand. I mean, they say before you actually do anything, before you dive into anything, first try to understand what it is, right? Before you get to fall in love with the woman, try to understand how she functions, isn't it? So that's what we're going to do right now. Try to understand potential, right? So according to what I have understood is that potential is an, is an inherent capability or capacity which can lead us to achieve success or excellence abundantly and exceedingly, right? Let me repeat that one more time. I'm saying that potential is an inherent capacity or ability that can lead us towards excellence or success. Now, when I talk about success in this case, I mean, people usually, you know, relate the term success to materiality gains, but that's not the case. No, I'm talking about, I mean, success, which is defined in the world of R. Nightingale as the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. In other words, 
whether you are a carpenter, whether you are an artist, whether I don't care what you do, as long as you find yourself every single day progressing day by day towards the ideal that is worthy to you, you are being successful. Now, the potential is that inherent capability, right, that enables you to move from where you are towards where you're supposed to be, right? Now, if it is something that leads you from where you are to where you're supposed to be, should we then say that it is a kept capability? Should we then say that it's a hidden talent? Or should we then say that it's a dormant ability? Because you see, here's the thing. Whatever you've done thus far, from, I don't know, the day we were born until now, is not part of your potential anymore. What you're going to do from today, going onwards, that is your potential. In other words, what I'm saying is that potential is what you can accomplish, but you have not yet accomplished. It's what you can achieve, and you are yet to achieve. That's when we are talking about potential, right? So, when we talk about potential, we're talking about, you know, what you can achieve. We talk about how far you can reach, who you can be. When you take a Ferrari car, for example, from the moment you, if I say Ferrari, I'm pretty sure the first thing that comes to your mind is speed and class. When I say Lamborghini, what comes to your mind? Probably speed and the look of it, right? Now, it means that there is a relationship between what identity and potential. Now, talking about identity, there are these three questions, lovely people, that every human being has been battling with for centuries and centuries. I meet people in Southeast Asia when I've been traveling for the past three years. I meet people, they will tell you that, hey, I'm traveling around, I've been around for the past three years now trying to find answers to some questions. And those pertinent questions are questions like this, who am I? Where am I from? Where am I going? What is my role on earth? Why am I here for? How am I supposed to fulfill that role? And I bet you that every single human being come to that cross path where they ask themselves that question. As a matter of fact, I'm convinced that somewhere, somewhere right now, somebody is looking for answers to these questions. And these questions, right, when people don't find the answers up to these questions, that's when we talk about depression. That's when we talk about suicide. When you speak to a depressed person, he will tell you, I don't feel that I belong to anything. Right? I don't know what role I'm playing. Right? These questions are the source to almost everything. Let me tell you something. Right? So, my father is an animist, if you know what animism is. So, animism is basically, um, it's, let me not say it's like Christianity, but it's also a religion, but mostly common to Africa. Right? And they believe that everything has a spirit. So you have the spirit of the tree, the spirit of, of water, the spirit of air, the spirit of, you know, so we have gods for almost everything. And my mom is a Christian, all right? And that enabled me to study the Bible at a very young age, you know, so I, I can quote a few verses of which I'm going to quote some along the way. But here's the thing. Over the, over the weekend, on Sunday, mom will drag you to church. And during the week, that will take you for rituals. Okay, we'll do rituals, right? Just like how Balinese do with sarungs and everything. You know, shirtless, we'll recite some incantations, call upon some gods, pour some drinks and whatever. We, do, we did all of that, right? So that led me to asking these questions at a very young age. When I'm talking about young age, I'm talking about already at the age of seven years old. I started asking these questions. But luckily for me, my parents were not parents that would say, hey, you are forced to follow this religion. So I was given the, that this liberty to actually research. And as a matter of fact, till today, I'm still on that path. Not to say that I have not found the answer to these questions. No, I have found my answer. But the reason why I'm telling this story is that to tell you that when it comes to, you know, answering this question, when it comes to understanding or knowing the different angles of these questions, I know something about it because I've been doing it for the past 21 years right now. Because I've been reading, I've been studying swamis, I've been studying priests, I've been studying imams, I've been, I've been all over trying to find the answers to these questions, right? So, who am I? Where am I from? 
where am I going? I know you guys want me to answer these questions right now, but stick around. I'm not going to answer it right now. <laughs> I'm joking. But here's the thing, right? Let me tell you. So I love this quote of Eric Erickson. So Eric Erickson actually is the gentleman that came up with all the eight stages um, according to which a human is actually defined. So you ha he says that at each stage of a human being, there are some things that we go through that actually defines the value that we carry, right? So it's, his theory is it's almost similar of the one of Fred, but the one of Fred put everything into the subconscious, right? And Fred mostly focused on the upbringing in the childhood. But Eric Erickson is saying that at each stage from the age of zero, right, to 16, there are little things and values that we embrace, like intimacy, right? Like, like love, like trust. Eric Erickson says that there are different kind of levels at which we embrace those values, right? So what does Eric Erickson say? He says that in the social jungle of human existence, there is no feeling of being alive without a sense of identity. We're talking about who am I? Where am I from? Where am I going? We're talking about identity, right? We're talking about who you truly are. We're talking about what is your identity. Eric Erickson is saying that in the social jungle, right? In other words, I mean, we may be social all around us, but it is a jungle. I love the quote of Les Brown, which says that life is a fight for territory. When you stop fighting for, for what you want, what you don't want takes over. In other words, we are in a fight for territory. We are in a social jungle. And in this social jungle, you do not feel alive, right? What, what are we talking about feeling alive, right? Feeling alive is that feeling when you just fell in love. Right? Feel alive is that, you know, you, you feel excited, you feel enthusiastic, you just want to go for more. That is what we're talking about feeling alive. There is that fire that burns in you, you know, of being something great, right? Again, embracing your identity. Again, navigating in the ocean, in the ocean of who am I, where am I from, where am I going, right? So Eric Erickson is saying that without knowing your identity, without embracing your true identity, there is no feeling of being alive, right? Now, <clears throat> we're talking about identity. We're talking about social jungle. We're talking about who am I, where am I from, where am I going? Now, let me share with you what I think who we are, right? Now, the reason why I'm about to give you this answer to these questions, the way I'm about to give it to you, is because the day I got to that realization, and I usually say that the day I met myself, literally, that's, that's what happened. I met myself the day I tapped into that answer, my whole world changed. Literally, I was transformed. So here we go. My firm belief is that we as people are gods, right? So I was telling you earlier on that um, I've read the Bible, by the way, which I stand for, and I don't care, who, I mean, whatever, whoever says. It is my firm belief that the Bible is one of the greatest books that has ever been written. A friend of mine says that um, just like how you make medications or you make cars and they come with a manual, the Bible is the manual of human beings, right? So it says that at the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. It says that at the beginning, man capital M-E-N, was created at the image of God. In other words, when I'm looking in the mirror, what am I looking at? I'm looking at God. Another friend of mine says that the closest man can get to in being what? A God or being in creation is by creating. In other words, when you are creating, you are expressing your godly nature. So to the question, who am I? I am God. I was at an interview uh, in Australia last year. And the interviewer asked me this very question, is that, um, who do you think you are? I'm like, hey, listen, young woman, I am God. You're looking at me, you're looking at God. I'm looking at you, I'm looking at God. So I have embraced that answer from an early age that, hey, there's nothing impossible for me. Everywhere that I will go, whether you give me the visa or not, I will take over. You get what I'm saying? So to the question, who am I? Where am I from? What is my potential? My potential comes from my godly nature. And you see, indeed, the potential may come from a godly nature. Indeed, I may have a godly nature in me, but that does not mean that releasing that potential 
is going to be a breeze, right? That does not mean that actually fulfilling what I am to fulfill in my life is going to be a breeze. I want to share something with you, right? Which you guys probably might love. I want to share the life short story, short summary of Abraham Lincoln for you, right? I want to share with you how this gentleman, in the process of releasing his potential, in the process of fulfilling what he is to fulfill, right? He actually struggled. Let's take a look quickly. He says that he was elected to Congress in 1846. If, if you know any better the biography of Abraham Lincoln, you'll know that before this year, he had lost his wife. He has lost his job. He had a nervous, a nervous breakdown, right? He has lost everything he has worked for for years, right? So there we go. And after that, so after you lose your wife, you lose your house, you had a nervous breakdown, you lose everything. Why is life for you? <laughs> I mean, nowadays, many, I mean, most people don't even go through that before, you know, I mean, you see them running around on the street and, you know, they cry for years and years, right? Like, they actually want to kill themselves. Okay? But here is Abraham Lincoln that after having gone through that again, you know, was elected in Congress in 1846. And just when he thought things were happening for him in 1849, he was rejected again in the position that he wanted to be in. And after that, he was defeated again and defeated again. And again, and guess what? Right after that, he was elected as president. Now, let me remind you, as a matter of fact, I don't have to remind you that in those days, as, as you still right now, if you are elected the president of the United States, right, you are kind of a big deal. <laughs> you are, if not the president of the world, like how they call it, right? So, this is the gentleman that says that, Abraham Lincoln, he says that whatever you are, be a good one. He also said that in the process of in the process of releasing your potential, make sure that you leave a trace, a trace that inspire others. Right? Now, what it is to release the potential? You see, the question is this. Is any potential even worth it if it is not being released? It is any potential even, you know, worth to be called for if it is not being released? Now, let me paint you a picture, for instance, right? So, we have cars. We drive cars. They make cars. And the speed of theirs goes all the way to 250, 240. But the rights on the road. You drive 100. You can't drive more than that. 50, 60, 120. I mean, the highest I've seen in countries I've traveled to is, is, is 120, right? Now, this does not mean that the car cannot be driven to 180 or 200, right? This does not mean that the potential in the car cannot be released to its fullest, right? So, when the potential of this car, which is the 180 or the 200, is being released and it's being driven, the professional drivers will tell you that at that speed, the car even performs at its best. They will tell you that, you know, I felt this smoothness in the car, you know, it, it, it almost like it was a brand new car again. You hear people say that, you know, it was that time when I actually thought that, you know, I couldn't do it anymore and I pushed one more time. I felt as if my wings were growing. I felt as if I was releasing my potential. So then, how do we release our potential, right? What are the keys to actually effectively releasing our potential so that when we release it, it positively impacts our world? Let us, let, let us look at it. So the keys to effective release of potential, right? What is the first key? Now, I mean, I could have called these principles. I could have called these points. I could have called it, uh, I mean, you name it, right? But I chose to call it a key for a reason, right? Because when you possess this key, when you embody this key, all doors have to be open before you. Because when you understand that, right, when I look into the mirror, what I'm looking at is God. 
everything is possible. When you know your source, when you know where you truly come from, when you know what you're here for, your attitude changes. You go from walking like this to standing tall. You go from saying that, I don't want to hear that I can't do it. All I know is I can do it. All I know is despite the fact that I'm from Togo. All I know is despite the fact that I'm from Togo, West Africa, despite the fact that I was born in a two-bedroom house with nine siblings, despite the fact that I walked to school for five, ten miles every single day, despite the fact that I went over to 18 countries for one purpose, to fulfill my potential, to achieve my goals, to change my circumstances for the better. Despite all that fact, I know I can still do it. Despite all that fact, I know that I can speak to 5 million people. I know that I can transform a continent. So this is the first key to releasing your potential. What is the second key? The second key is know how you function, right? It is my belief that every single person is functioning according to a law, right? You know that as an architecture is that, I mean, I'm not a professional architecture. But I'm pretty sure logic tells me that when you build something, right, and, and, and the law that you're applying to build the thing, okay, you don't, you, don't, you don't execute that in the right manner, most likely the building will collapse. I know that everything we build is governed by a law. As a matter of fact, you as a human being also is governed by a law. That's why you just see that there are some things that, you know, when somebody does it to you, you don't even know where it comes from. You just don't like it. There are some foods, I mean, you've never even seen it your entire life. It's not like, it's not as if, you know, they could make an argument and say that, you know what, no, because you were a child, you didn't know. You just don't like it. Because the law, the principle by which you are governed, does not like it does not embrace it. So know how you function. Know how does that law function within you or through you, if I may say. Right? That's the second key. What's the third key? Third key is know your purpose. Oh, man. Listen, let me tell you something. I love the quote of Dr. Masmoro when he says that the greatest tragedy in life is not death, but it's to live a life without a purpose. I want to repeat that one more time, right? The greatest tragedy in life is not death. No, what is death? I mean, death is okay. Yeah, okay, I'm going to die. Everybody will sing. They will eat. I mean, back home in Africa, they will slaughter a cow. They will eat, you know, dance. They will play drums. And okay, all right, that's cool. Okay, thank you. Right. But have I fulfilled my purpose? Have I actually made the impact that I'm supposed to make? Have I made any difference at all in the life of my people? What is the story that's being told when I'm lying there in the coffin? All oh, right, okay, yeah, okay, he was a gentleman, you know, yeah, he worked, uh, he, he was paid $1,000 per month, you know, all right, cool. Have I fulfilled my purpose? What is your purpose? So knowing your purpose is key, and I want to emphasize that the purpose is totally different from a vision. The purpose of a thing never changes. The vision can change. The purpose is defined as the intent of creation of a thing. We can have different type of shoes. The vision of shoes may change, but the purpose of shoes will never change. Whether it's a thousand dollar or a five thousand dollar, it's there to protect our feet. That's what it is. I don't care who's wearing it. Lady Gaga, Michael Jordan, it's for our feet. The purpose of feet, will, I mean, of shoes will never change. How we visualize them, though, that will change. So what is your purpose, right? What it is that you truly live for every single day? What it is that you wake up for to go out there and make a difference for? What kind of steps do you take in your life on a daily basis to actually help you to fulfill your purpose? So that's the key, the key number three. Know your purpose, right? Key number four. Have the, I'm not sorry, understand your resources. My bad. So, yeah, we talk about resources, okay? And uh, this is also another very important point because usually 
you'll hear people complain, right? That I don't have this, I don't have that, I don't have this, I don't have that. Let me tell you something. You have everything. It's your inability to notice those resources. That's what you are lacking. Not the resources. It's the resourcefulness of being able to identify the resources that you have around you. That's what you are lacking. You know, I'm not sure whether you've noticed this, ladies and gentlemen, but at least for, for, for my life is that whenever I want to accomplish something, all I have to do is to really, really, really look around me. When I look around me, thoroughly enough, I've got to find someone that can help me accomplish that goal. Even if that person is not in my life at that very point in time, then I've got to go back to the places where I frequent often. Then I've got to go to, the, to those coffee shops where I meet people. And most likely I'll have the resources that I need to achieve what I want to achieve. If you want it badly enough, it has to be yours. Ask and you shall receive. Search and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. Understand your resources, right? Understand your resources. Very vital. Key number five. Have the right environment. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot emphasize, you know, much more on this key, right? Because it is almost everything. You see, I love the quote that says that the great people are the one that when they look for circumstances, they cannot find them. They create them. But I also love the quote that says that a seed is the product of its environment. You can take a seed, ladies and gents, put it on a tile. For 50 years, it will not grow. But take it, put it on the soil, add some water to it. Boom, it grows. And let me not even add that that's in that seed, actually, what you see is a tree. And in the tree, there are other fruits. And another fruit is another tree. And then another tree is another fruit. And another fruit and another tree. And a tree of fruit, a fruit, a tree, a tree, a tree, a tree of fruit. So in other words, we are actually holding the seed in your hand. What you are actually holding is a forest. That is the potential of the seed. That is what the seed could accomplish. That is what the seed could be, but it's not yet. So the question is, what environment are you in right now? Is that environment enable you, enabling you to actually be that which you could be? Are you surrounding yourself with the right people? I love Les Brown when he says QPO, quality people only. Select the people you go with. That's why I don't do friends, ladies and gentlemen. I don't do friends, right? If you come into my life, I've got to learn something from you or vice versa. Right? We've got to be there to empower each other. Don't ever tell me, my friends will tell you, don't, don't ever tell me that I can't do a thing. The day you say that, I'm going to stand up and you don't know me anymore. Forget it. Have the right environment, lovely people. It is key. Because without that environment, without the right compass, without the, without the rich soil, your growth is doomed. Your success is up for grabs. Right? With that said, what is the sixth and last key? Work to mine your hidden potential. Right? Now, there's a reason why you highlighted the word work in here. Okay? So, when we talk about work, lovely people, um, <laughs> We, we think as if, you know, going to 9 o'clock in the morning and then coming back at 5 and then do that again, you know, till the 31st of December. But here's the thing. When I thoroughly researched the meaning of this word work, I found out that actually in Hebrew, this word work means arrogant, right? And arrogant means what? Your gift. So in other words, when you say that, you know, work, work is not your job. Work is what? Find your gift and unleash that gift. Because in the process of unleashing this gift, what do you do? You, one way or the other, impactly, I mean positively, 
impact your world. You know, <laughs> I, I want to share something interesting with you, right? So, <laughs> I mean, in Western countries, I mean, you, you don't get to hear of chickens anymore, right? Like, I mean, the chickens, you only get to hear of them, you know, if you do on people's plates, right? <laughs> but, I mean, in, you know, developing countries like Bali, for instance, I'm, I'm not saying Bali is a country, don't call me for Indonesia, for instance, like, like my country, Togo, Ghana, and so forth, right? When it's six o'clock in the morning, how do we know it's six o'clock or it's five o'clock or it's seven o'clock? It's by the sound of the chicken. Ooh, 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 ooh. Ah, okay, it's time to wake up. That is our alarm system. So, I mean, here is the chicken gifted with making the sound. Ooh, 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 ooh. But that is the sound at which people are using to wake up in the morning. In other words, when you find your gift and you truly live in by it, there is no way that you will not serve other people. It is inevitable. So you've got to find your gift, lovely people. I don't know how much I can emphasize in that. You've got to find your gift. And if you ask me the question, what is my gift? How can I find it? Very simple. Ask yourself this question. What it is that I do? Or what it is that I can do, and I can do it again and again and again and again and again and again without the loss of enthusiasm. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, take me now, put me in front of 50 million people. I will be speaking to them till tomorrow morning. Take me now and put the person that is demotivated in front of me. I swear to you, five minutes after, he will leave me extremely motivated, happy like never before. Because that is my gift. And you've got to discover your gift. And usually, when we are in a job, at least if you've chosen the right job, the job is a circumstance in which allows us to actually find that gift and sharpen that gift. Right? I'm able to do what I do today to stand here and say proudly that my gift in speaking is because I have been in sales. And as a sales manager, if anybody has been a sales manager, they will tell you that your success is not depending about how, how good you can sell goods. No, your success depends on how good you can sell story to the people that are beneath you. So if you can actually sell great stories to them and give them a sense of meaning to their life, then you're successful as a sales manager. And that's what I did for years, lovely people. Every time, 6 o'clock in the morning, people that work with me, they will tell you, you are passionate or you are 100% you are passionate or you are not. 6 o'clock in the morning, we'll get together. Because the entire weekend, while others were partying, I mean, I, I'm at home creating motivational concept, right? Because I'm going to present that to my team on Monday morning at 6 o'clock. And I ensured that whatever I knew, they know. And that is when I discovered that actually, you know what? This is something that I can do hands in my pocket. That is when I discovered that, you know what? Speaking to ignite a transformation in people. Speaking to bring the best out of them. Speaking to make them see the light. Speaking to tell them, I mean, to make them say, oh, yes, I can do this. And that is what is my gift. So you've got to find your gift, lovely people. I don't know how much I can emphasize that, but you've got to find your gift. And once you find that gift, make it happen, man. Release it. Release that potential. Because you see, I've asked this question to a very close friend of mine. Albert is his name. Rest in peace, actually. Albert has lived a very tough life. You know. Albert put himself through school. Got a job. After that, he went to start his own company a few years down the line. He went bankrupt. After going bankrupt, he tried again. He failed again. After that, you know, there was an accusation put up on him. He was locked up. And in the meantime, his wife and children died in a car accident. Eventually, when he got out of jail, he wanted to become a priest, right? Dedicate his life to God. And while he was actually practicing as a, as a priest, he was again thrown, thrown upon false accusations. So pretty much he died in jail, right? But here's the thing. 
while Albert was going through that because he was much older than me, right? Uh, he, Albert was was actually part of our neighborhood back in Togo, and uh, he's this old guy that just, just loves kids. So for whatever reason, we kept in touch when you know travel and all those things were happening, and we write letters to each other. Okay, and I still remember the last letter that I received from Albert till today. The words in those letters. And actually, I, I even quote those words in some of my podcasts, right? As well as my book here. I, Albert says this, right? He says that, I mean, he calls me young man, young man in French, you know, you know, okay. So, he, Albert said that in life, whatever we go through or whatever we do, we've got to make sure that we do it our best. At the best, at the best, at the best. He also said that life is too short. So only take with you the lessons you've learned and forget about, you know, all the little gossips and all those things. Because when you're in the process of actually releasing your potential, when you're in the process of letting go, right with a force with the force of realization letting go of what you actually made of you are maximizing that there is no time to play those were the words of albert so maximizing your potential right so i mean i don't know about you but i'm a person that <laughs> i mean when i do something i this is the quote i believe in that everything worth doing is worth doing greatly Okay, so, I mean, you got to do it well or you don't do it well. All right, yeah. I mean, the things that you see in here, I make sure that I spend time on it and I study it thoroughly. I know what I'm talking about, right? I research, I read books, spend hours, and make sure that I know what I'm talking about. Everything worth doing is worth doing greatly. So, if you are releasing your potential, just make sure that you maximize it too. No holding back. So how do we then maximize this potential, right? What are the keys to effectively maximizing your potential? First key, cultivate this thing. Any farmer will tell you that if you plant a seed, you don't check up on it, and you hope for it to grow, weeds will take over. So if you found that gift within, and you indeed want to let it explode and positively impact your world, then you've got to invest in it and cultivate it. I don't care whether there are 10 people that come to my speak up, ladies and gentlemen. I don't care whether there is 100 people. I've spoken to empty chairs before in my career. I will speak. I don't care. Because it's not for you that I'm doing it, it's for me. I've spent money inviting people to webinars, but nobody showed up. Okay, good, all right, I get that. Say hi, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to my talk to the Transformation Zone. Today is the day that you change. You've got to cultivate your gift. Make sure it is sharpened, it is polished, it shines. You know, just like how you look on Christmas Day. I don't know about you, but I, down there in Africa, when it's 25th on Christmas, you know, we wear that cloth. There is one cloth that is in there in the drawer. That, that is there for, for Christmas only, right? And on that day, what happens is mom is going to cook spaghetti. We're going to eat rice. Yeah? So, I mean, rice out there is not like, yeah, where, you know, this, uh, the average Indonesian is 150 kg of rice every single, every single day. No, that's not the case. Rice and spaghetti are foods of luxury. And I remember, I got to work very hard at school, and the day I get that Sprite. I mean, today I can walk in any store and buy Sprite the way I want. Guys, listen, let me tell you something. I only drank Sprite on my birthday, on Christmas, and on those days where I work really hard at school. That's it. Forget about it. And when I had that Sprite, I got to make sure that all my neighbor, my neighbor would see it. Say, yeah, I'm drinking Sprite today. <laughs> yeah, and I got to go out there and, you know, walk there and stand you know, right in the middle of the street with my chair and table and everything, and I'm drinking that Sprite. You know, don't you dare tell me that I don't, I'm not going to drink the Sprite because I work for it. So it is special, lovely people, to cultivate your potential. You've got to cultivate it. You've got to work and you've got to shine. You've got to make 
keep the finest ever. Right? That is the first key. What is the second key? Second key is God is. Okay? Earlier when I spoke to you about having the right environment. Okay? So guarding your potential is guarding your potential against those poisonous people. You know, let me tell you something. Not everybody in your life right now is going to contribute to your progress. It's going to contribute to your happiness. No. Close or from afar. Not everybody. Or at least not everything you're going to get into, you're going to involve yourself into is going to make you progress. So you've got to make sure that your potential is well guarded. That gift of yours is well guarded. Right? I love the quotes that says that alcohol clouds the judgment of even the king. Which means that regardless of your royalty, when you, you know, engage yourself into a lot of consumption of alcohol, your judgment will be clouded. And when your judgment is clouded, it means that your reasoning is clouded. And when your reasoning is clouded, what does that mean? There's no more potential. Well, those, are, those are just one of the things. I'm not judging. I'm not saying that people should not drink. But I'm saying that guard your potential against those people or those actions which you may take. That will prevent you from being what you could be. That will prevent you from taking the step from where you are right now to what you are yet to accomplish. Don't rob me, man. Don't rob me. Do not rob me. I don't want to be robbed. I don't want you to rob me of your potential because I'm not going to rob you. So you better be fair to me. In other words, when you choose to keep your gift for yourself, you are robbing me. You are robbing me. And you know what? There are millions of people that have robbed us because they chose to go in the gravity. I read something the last day that says that the wealthier place on earth is not the uranium mines of South Africa or Congo. It's not the oil fields of Saudi Arabia. But it's the symmetry. He says that in the cemetery, when you go in the cemetery, if, if, if only it could be mined. Because you know what? The richest mine actually is not the mine of gold or of oil, you know, but it's the mine in which you have people's potential. The richest mine is the mine of the mind. So if only we could mine cemeteries, we will find probably books that were not written. When I talk about Dr. Miles Monroe, you know, he, this guy wrote 66 books that were traduced in 185 languages. And this guy was born in a two-bedroom house with 11 siblings. He was number six. When they slept, they slept with cockroaches and stuff. When I listen to him, it actually reminds me of my story. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know, but, you know, I mean... <laughs> I don't know if you know. I don't know if you know what it is like to sleep with just out of five siblings, right, in just one bed like this, you know? I mean, like, you know, I'm talking about bed. But what bed? We're talking about the floor. I don't know if you know what it is that, you know, there's a food dish up by your mom, and because you're the youngest one, you've got to make sure you eat very fast because the brothers, they have huge palms on you. Right? So you've got to make sure you eat very fast because that meal is for that day. I don't know if you know what that is. I don't know if you know what it is, you know, to spend days with no food. Because I know. I don't know if you know what it is, you know, to meet people and they tell you in your face that because you are black, you cannot do this. They tell you that, no, yeah, you want to be a speaker? Speak up. Come on, man, you're from Africa. Like, get, 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 get out of here. Like, what? You know what it is? I know what it is. And those are the people that you must guard your potential from. Because once you let those people get into your potential, the war is over. <laughs> right? So that's the key number two. Now, by three, share your potential. I was saying about now that do not rob me, right? You see, when you have a gift, those that, you know, have merit, you know, and, and I mean, in the, 
you know, exercising of the gift, in the expression of their gift, you know, they will tell you that they gave it away for years. And when it's time to get paid for it, they got paid a huge amount. I read a meme, I think two days ago on the internet. It says that <laughs> Usain Bolt got paid $119 billion, right, for running 20 seconds or something like that. But for him to be paid that, he had to work for it for 20 years. What is your gift right now? Are you sharing it the right way? When you do something that you know that you are really great at to someone, do you immediately ex accept, I mean, expect a return? Or you give it away with open heart? Knowing that because I have an abundance of this, if I had to be paid for it one day, I'm going to get paid for all the years that I've given it away for free. Jay Chetty, probably you guys know Jay Chetty. He will tell you the same thing that when he started speaking at universities, when he organized talks, the chairs were empty. But the day, the day that his gift blasted, he went from what, a bare thousand views to 12 million views in you know, a space of weeks. Oh, Michael Jordan. Let, let me not even go to Michael Jordan, right? I was reading the book the last time that talked about coolers. Closers and cleaners. Coolers are those that watch it happen. Cl closers are those that wonder what happened. And cleaners are those that make it happen. And Market Jordan is a cleaner. The man can take the ball and do all kind of things with it. But how many years is he giving it for free before that day could come? So you've got to share your potential, lovely people. That's the key number three. Key number four understand the laws of limitations. There is no way you're going to put water in a car and expect it for it to run. Understand what are the laws of limitations that you are governed by. Because when you understand what are the laws of limitations you are governed by, you are able to transform those limitations into what? Into opportunities. When you understand the exact type of fuel you could put in the car to maximize its performance, you know that you can take that same fuel, put it into a laboratory, and even increase its performance as well. So it is important that you understand the laws of limitations that you are governed by. And that goes back to the point we are speaking about. Identity. Identity. I don't know about you. I don't know how much you know yourself, though. I don't know if you, if you truly believe it. I don't know if you really walk around with the mindset and the belief that, hey, I can do anything. Hey, I don't care what you tell me. I am the thing that does the thing. You see, lovely people. <clears throat> At the age of 18, when I left my country, Togo, West Africa, and you know, usually when I talk about Togo, people don't even know Togo. They're like, they're like what? Tokyo? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, oh, dude, like, come now. Like, look at me. Look at me, right? Like, you know, <laughs> you know, like, you know, they, they don't make, you know, to Tokyo product like this, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, when I left Togo, you know, we, we know with a firm conviction that, you know what, I'm going to change my circumstances, you know, I want to achieve my dreams. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, if they ask me what it is, you know, what decision you could have taken that is that I mean, you could have taken better in your life right now, I will tell the person, and I say it all the time, that you know what, I would not have chosen to even go on that trip, although it has made me what I am today, because lovely people, it was a hard trip. You know, at a point I was sleeping in the shack, and the rent was twenty dollars. I couldn't even afford the rent; it was twenty dollars. And in that shack, you know, mice will come and eat your food. They'll be looking at you like, hey, what can you do? We know you broke. <laughs> you know? But here's the thing. Here's the thing. You see, I was totally aware 
of what my limitations were. And it's because of that awareness that I was able to break them. It's because I knew exactly what place the society, or at least the system, made for me. And that's why I was able to break through it. So it is important that you've got to understand thoroughly what laws of limitations you are governed by. You know, and I love this quote that says, The tragedy strikes when success dies in failure, hope dies in despair, and visions die in the absence of confidence. I want you to read this quote one more time. Right? It says, Tragedy strikes when success dies in failure. Hope dies in despair and visions die in the absence of confidence. What did I say before? The greatest tragedy in life is not even death. But what? A life without a purpose. Which means, you know, when there is desperation. Which means when you don't see that, you know, that headlight of success anymore. That is when we talk about tragedy. When you've given your potential to the wolves, we got a problem, right? So, what are the enemies of potential, right? What are the things, you know, yeah, we're talking about, you know, gardening, we're talking about, you know, all these lovely concepts, but, you know, in practicality, right? In practically speaking, what are the things, what are the enemies? I love the quote, the, 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 the quote, the African proverb that says that the enemies within can, you know, the enemies outside can do us no harm if there are no enemies within. Right? So, what are the enemies of potential? The number one, fear. False evidence appearing real. I'm pretty sure you've heard that before. Right? Enemy number one, fear. Scared of this, scared of that. Oh. And they will tell you, I am not scared. Bring it on. <laughs> what, what am I scared of? Death, 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 really? Bring it on. <laughs> I'm ready for it. Fear. What is fear? Fear is as simple as, right, a, a memory, I don't say a painful memory that we save in here. And then we just kept that, we just, re, I mean, keep on replaying that every time a similar circumstance arrives. That is what fear is. So in other words, if you are able to be aware of, you know, what that painful memory was, you are good to go. Fear, self-doubt, and low self-esteem, right number two, number three, those are the enemies within. As a matter of fact, that is why I wrote the book, Be Transformed. Because you see, when I've been on this journey for the past 10 years, right, going from one challenge to the other, consistently, you know, overcoming challenges, consistently transforming myself, consistently overcoming those three things, I'll find myself in the middle of the night, pacing my room like this, you know, damn, I can do this, right? I am the man, right? I am great. Dr. Norman Vincent Peel, the power of positive thinking, right? Leave it and you can do it. Ogmandino. Those are the three toughest demons that you have to overcome. Fear, self-doubt, and low self-esteem. Self-doubt is the paralyzing force which stops you from taking action. Low self-esteem is the feeling of being awkward, incompetent, unlovable. It's the lack of confidence in yourself. And I cannot tell you how many people suffer from those three enemies out there in the world. As a matter of fact, everyone does in a certain particular area of their life. And that's going to take me to enemy number four. Procrastination. Hmm. I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> we know that. <laughs> I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I'll do it tomorrow. Right. You know, tomorrow is another day. But while you are saying that, you're busy having coffee, you're busy watching TV, you're busy playing video games, you know, walking around. I'll do it tomorrow. It can be done tomorrow. No way it cannot be done tomorrow. It has to be done today. Sundown rules. Today. Today is the day. There's no tomorrow. Today is the day. Get it done today. You got to practice that guitar. Practice it today. Six hours every single day. You got to create that architecture thing. Do it today. You got to draft that plan. Do it today. 
if you have had a lot to do that day and that enabled you to do that, then it's a different story. But the point is to have a do it today mindset. That's not tomorrow, it's today because you do not know what tomorrow holds for you. Right? What's the enemy number five? Discouragement. Right? Courage is defined as what? The ability to go from challenge to challenge without the loss of enthusiasm. Right? In other words, discouragement is when you lose the enthusiasm after encountering one challenge. No, there are two types of people in love, lovely people. The ones that get motivated by the challenge and the ones that become like this gentleman when there is a challenge. Which one do you want to be? I tell you what, the one I want to be. Oh, bring the challenge on. I feed that myself. That is my birthday present. That is my Christmas present. That is my lunch. That is my dinner. That is my breakfast. Bring on the challenge. I want some more. Because whatever you're going to throw at me, it's not going to make me weak. No. It's only going to motivate me further. They say, but you don't even know where you're going to sleep tomorrow morning if our boss does not give you a place to sleep. Those were my four boys that I was digging a fish, a fish pond with at 7 p.m. at night. I said, but you don't even have food to eat. How can you still be so enthusiastic? How can you be so confident? I say, I don't care. I just know. Discouragement. How do you feel when you encounter a challenge, right? Are you the one that, you know, just dropped your shoulders? Or are you the one that says, it's okay, it's part of life, but I'm going to keep going? Discouragement. Point number six. Path failures. I was talking about that just now, right? You see, a friend of mine, he's actually from Pakistan, very, very smart guy, he can write a program like this. He says that he wished he had no memory. <laughs> he wished, you know, he, he didn't memorize things because, because it's because he memorizes things. That's why he has the fear. That's why, he, you know, past failures, you know, that's why things like that drag him behind. So, I mean, the truth is that failures are inevitable, Right? Thomas Edison, I haven't failed. I just found 10,000 times. I just found 10,000 other ways which wouldn't work. So can we really avoid failures? Can we really let failures, right, which teaches us all the possible combinations, all the possible cheating codes in the system, should we then let past failures be our enemies of us unleashing our potential? Then the answer is no. The answer is a big no. So what is the last enemy is distractions. Right? You guys know something about that. Distractions, right? Being distracted. The in, I mean, being unable to focus on what you want to do. Focus is key, right? Like the people that have been around me, they will tell you that when I want to do something, oh man, I'm extremely focused. Right? Don't even say good morning to me because I'm not, I'm not listening. <laughs> I have my full attention is in it, right? You come back the morning I'm doing it, the following day I'm selling it. My whole body is focused on it. Focus and avoid distractions. Because one distraction leads to the next. And the greatest distraction we have nowadays, you know, social media, right? If you want to do something, I love what Petro says. If you want to do something, just switch off the phone. You know, that's what I do. I just Slide down, switch off my data, boop. I focus on doing what I want to do, what I, what I have to do, right? Now, <clears throat> you know, I love, you know, I, I love that when you want to combat an enemy, when you want to fight an enemy, it's important that you know your enemy, right? When people go to war, they spend months and months, you know, flying jets and trying to understand, you know, the strategical operation of their enemy, isn't so? So, what are these enemies? What is the source? Where do they come from? I believe that, you know, the enemies come from nothing but our belief system. Right? What it is that we believe about ourselves. What is the perception of yourself about yourself? You know, let me share something interesting with you. It's a quote in the concept of leadership, right? Um, and it's, it's a quote that I love, you know, um, 
bringing about when I'm doing my, my, my speeches around leadership. It says that a sheep, that a sheep, yeah. It says a sheep, right, which leads a lion in, um, which, which leads a pack of lions in battle will definitely fail. Unlike a lion, which leads a pack of sheep into battle. In other words, when, li- when a lion is leading a pack of sheep, the perceptions of the sheep about themselves change. They perceive themselves as lions. And the opposite happens when a sheep is leading a pack of lions. And the perceptions of ourselves is everything. And that comes from what the ideas that we choose to embrace on a daily basis. What are, what, what are the facts, the core facts about beliefs, right? Beliefs are the idea we commit and support to, the views and opinions of others, the rules we buy into and endorse. You know, <laughs> those days when I used to wear one jean for one week, you know, I'll go to church and there was this beautiful, pretty, pretty girl there at church, you know, high and everything, right? You know, well built. And in the church, there was this gentleman who came from, you know, a very wealthy family. I mean, me being me, I tried to talk to the girl, you know, tell her how pretty she is and you know, how much I wish I could be with her. And this is what she told me. And that left a scar so deep in my soul, right? It said that this girl told me that, <laughs> hey, listen, man, like, I don't hang around with broke guys, right? <laughs> and that, w- w- you know what happened? That was just an idea that she planted. But that idea grew so mature in me that for, for years I told myself that no woman wants you when you are broke. And I will tell you, it was a great source of motivation for me, though. But what if when you are told every day that you are worthless? What if when you are told every day that you are ugly? Is what it becomes a belief that you buy into. Right, so what is the perception of yourself about yourself? Do you perceive yourself as being indeed of a godly nature? Do you perceive yourself as being of a royal blood? Or you perceive yourself as being a slave? Now remember that, you know, the chains of slavery can be removed. But the mindset of slavery can still stay behind. So it's important that you fix your belief about yourself, right? You fix how you view yourself, okay? Now, <clears throat> I'm quickly gonna go through the sources quickly, right? The source one is the opinion of others, right? What people say about you, what people think of you, okay? Source number two, the wrong environment, okay? We brace that <clears throat> later on. Number three, sometimes it's tradition, we do things a certain way, okay, without even knowing why, you know? And, and my father is, is one person that is you know, really, although he's, I mean, he, he's a big animist, but again, he, like, he, he doesn't buy into that, right? He loves changing things around, you know? So, yeah, tradition sometimes is a huge, huge, huge hold back to us, right? We do things a certain way. That's how it's got to be. I mean, we could change them a little bit, right? Yeah. And innovate a little bit, right? Why? We have a godly nature, right? Yeah. Let's innovate. Let's change it. Let's make it more beautiful. Let's make it more exciting, right? Great. So now, but for comparison, right? He's there. He's there. The greatest comparison you can do to yourself is yourself. I compare myself to myself. I'm breaking my own boundaries today, tomorrow. I don't care about what you're doing. Thank you. If you're doing well, you make your million. All right. Go ahead. I'm coming. But be careful because when I come to take over, I might take over with a huge gap. Right? So comparison, make the right comparison. Okay? Very important. Number five, society's pressure. All right? So, I mean, we have, we now in a society where, I mean, you go, you browse into your feed and like everybody's buying a Lamborghini every single day. Right? The guy you knew two years ago, you see him on your feed right now, okay, he's, he's flying a helicopter. <laughs> Whether it's true or not, nobody knows, right? But there is a pressure anyway. Whether we like it or not. Okay. Now, those things, okay, forms a belief in us, whether we know it or we don't. Right? People are supposed to dress a certain way. 
You're supposed to make up a certain way, right? Beliefs are powerful, right? So what is your belief, right? I mean, when I was shipped with the belief that because I am black, because I'm from Togo, because I'm from a country nobody even knows of, I cannot do this and that, that was an idea that was planted into me of which when I fed it, it will become a belief. Right? But when I chose to do what? To be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I break away from that belief. In other words, what I'm telling you, lovely, lovely ladies and gentlemen, is that the way to break your beliefs, the way to overcome the enemies of potential, if they're already there in your life, right, is to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've got to renew your mind. And this is the daily process. Transformation can be instant, right? Like Mark Fisher says in the book of Instant Billionaire. He says that we transform, you know, not in years. You, you become a millionaire, he says. Not the time or the day when you have the million dollars stuck into your account. But the moment, the time, the second when you realize, you come to that full realization. Every single cell of your body realizes that today my day has come. That is when transformation happens. Or it can also be a process. It can happen. One day at a time. But that instant, that moment is key. Right? That you are transformed by the renewing of your mind. And renewing your mind is key, ladies and gentlemen. It is key. Because the three toughest demons of mankind, fear, self doubt, and low self-esteem, they are there every single day. They shower with us. They bath with us. We take walks with them. We go to dates with them. I don't care what it is. It can be in your relationship. It can be in your job. It can be in your, I mean, in your friends. It can be, it's everywhere. So you've got to renew your mind every single day. Right? And, and that is the reason why I put this book together. After having go through those 10 years, how I was able to renew my mind, the things that I did, the words that I spoke, how I changed my language throughout the 10-week program. That's what I put in my book titled Be Transformed, The 10-Week Journey to Your True Self. So that when you stand and you want to release that potential, to positively impact the people. So that when I stand in front of people and release that gift in me so that they can be impacted, so that they can be inspired, so that they can be transformed, so that they can become an A-plus version of themselves, I do that with a renewed mind, right? So I've got seven steps, right, quickly, okay, that you can actually use, okay, to renew your mind. First of all, it's decision. It's key. Decision is everything. All right? Anything that has been done in, the, in this entire universe started with a decision. As a matter of fact, if you read the Bible at the beginning, it says that what God decided to create the earth, so it started with the decision. This decision is everything. You marry because you decide. You buy a car because you decide. You build a house because you start a business because you decide. You make bread because you decide. Everything is a decision. So decide to transform. Decision is key, right? Number two, you've got to identify what it is that is holding you back. Okay, you cannot fight an enemy you do not know. It's important that you identify what is holding you back, what is that limiting belief. And when you identify it, speak it out. Like Napoleon Hill says, spill it out. Name and shame it. That's what I mean by name and shame it. Name and shame it. Say it the way it is. My limiting belief for years, for years, ladies and gentlemen, have been because you see, I mean, I mean, I grew up in a system where I mean, black people are looked down upon. Our education system is way behind. You know, I mean, we still start in things of the colonialism time. You know, I mean, even though I'm, I believe that I'm extremely intelligent. Whenever I'm next to a Westerner, you know, the Westerner seems to be more advanced than me because he has a better education system. But that does not make me less smarter than him. You know, and I've had, you know, this limiting belief for years that because I am black, because I'm from Africa and having lived in South Africa, I didn't make it any better at all. I don't have to tell you about apathy, having gone through numerous amounts of racism. But to transform, I had to name and shame it. I had to spill it out that it is what it is so that I am able to overcome it by finding the primary trigger where it comes from the day it started. Trust it back in time. 
right? And applying the right techniques. And you know, some of the better techniques are simple as repeating the right outcomes of yourself. How you view yourself after that limiting belief, repeating that every single day. You know, one of the things that I can, I can share with you right now is the quote, I mean, not the quote, but the scrolls of Ogmandino. Today, I begin a new life. Today, I shed my old skin, which I too long suffered the breeze of failure and the woods of mediocrity. Today, I am born anew, and my birthplace is a vineyard where there is fruit for all. And at the end, he says that what? Today, I will walk tall among men, they will know me not. For today, I am a new man with a new life. For today, I am a new Stephen with a new life. For today, I am a new speaker with a new life. For today, I am a new coach with a new life. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It was a pleasure and honor speaking to you. Have a great day. Have a great night. Bye-bye. <laughs> you have any question? Okay, great. Thank you.